Hi, I'm Jan Vitkowski at Goldspring Harbour Laboratory, and this is the second day of the 84th Symposium uh, that have been held out annually since uh, 1933. Uh, the topic this year is uh, RNA control and regulation. I'm delighted to have Jeremy Willis here from the University of Pennsylvania. In fact, doubly delighted because Jeremy is the first Watson School graduate to talk at a symposium. Jeremy, what I've been told. <laughs> welcome back to your old haunts. Thank you, Jan. Great to see you. Um, you're talking tomorrow, right. so give me and everybody else a little bit of background on what you're going to be talking about. Sure. So, in general, what I'm interested in are um, kind of unusual looking RNAs. We've known for 50 years sort of what an RNA is, is supposed to look like, an mRNA, and the whole point of making an mRNA is to get it to be translated. So you need to splice the RNA, you need to add modifications to the 5' and 3' ends to stabilize it, and so that's obviously very important and how many mRNAs look. But then the question is, do all RNAs look how we think they were? And, and the sort of analogy I give is something like microRNAs. Before, like 20 years ago, microRNAs didn't exist. They clearly did exist, we just didn't know about them because no one thought RNAs that small would look. And so what drives our research and what I'll, I'll talk about is can we find other unusual classes of RNAs? Can we find um, RNAs that aren't even linear, that are, for example, circular and have covalently closed ends or are, are processed in unusual ways um, that we would not expect? So did you set out, you set out deliberately to look for these peculiar Yeah, it's RNAs? an interesting thing. So. Uh, back in my Cold Spring Harbor days, that was never our goal to ever find unusual RNAs. We've always set out to say, let's take um, loci that we know are relevant in disease or developmental processes and understand all we can about them. And so about 10 years ago now, we figured out that um, a very abundant RNA in cells that happens to be non-coding and, and misregulated in cancer doesn't have this canonical poly A tail on its three prime end, which is quite unusual. Um, we, there was talks this morning about once you remove a poly A tail from the transcript, you should get rapidly degraded. And yet here's a transcript that naturally never has a poly A tail, but it's super abundant. And so once we sort of figured out that that exists and understood how its end gets stabilized, that was all by accident, to be honest. And so it really then said to us, um, you know, if we go looking for things, what else can we find? Because nature is, is very clever, and just because we figured out one way that it's figured out how to do its tricks, I'm sure there's others. So, so some of what we do now is very purposeful to say, um, let's look at high throughput sequencing data in a, in a different way or in a unique way, or do high throughput screens to find um, things that we may not be expecting. And so you mentioned just a moment ago that you know, the, the expectation is that an, an RNA molecule is a linear thing. Well, I guess tRNAs aren't. But, you know, uh, and you made a reference to circular RNAs. I would, would never expect it to find a circular RNA. Th that there are such things. Yeah, so I, I don't think before a few years ago much of us um, thought anything about them. So. Um, they're made um, from many genes, actually, and made um, through canonical splicing processes that were originally found here at Cold Harbor at MIT. And in normal splicing, you'll take different exons, so for example, exon 1 and join it to exon 2, and then exon 2 join it to exon 3. Um, but what's really interesting with these circles is instead of taking an end of an exon and connecting it to the next one, you'll connect it, for example, to the beginning of that exon. So it seems like on the surface it's the same exact um, process of splicing and just joining those ends, but it's really um, in some ways unexpected because if you take a perfectly good protein coding gene and if you splice it in that way that now maybe only a single exon is included in that RNA, you have to wonder, well, why would you do that? Mm -hmm. Because, for example, you may have removed the start codon. And so even though this is encoding a protein coding gene, there's no way that that mature RNA that you've made can possibly make that circle. And so it's really still fairly curious in the field why these exist. Um, there's some genes where the dominant thing that's accumulating from that gene is a circle, and it's unclear why. Um, 
there are examples of circles that can bind specific RNAs or specific proteins and uh, sequester them. There's um, thoughts that they could be translated, but there's still plenty of these where it's really not clear what it's doing. And I think it's exciting for many reasons, not only understanding what are these new RNAs that we really didn't know much about until the last few years are doing, but how also then is that regulated? How does the cell decide uh, to make a linear RNA or to make a circle? So when it, when it makes a circle, can it make a circle of the entire RNA? I mean, can you get the end of exon 3 splice to... Yeah, so, so, it, so almost everything is possible <laughs> except for the, the ends of the, right. the gene, because at the, one, at the 5 prime end of an RNA you would have a cap structure, and at the 3 prime end you'd have a poly A tail, so you can't covalently close them. But there are clear examples where you'll have, for example, many different circles being made. So you might have single exon 2 form a circle, or you might have then exons 2 and 3 together to form a circle. And so how all that's regulated and what all that means is, is, is unclear. And even just identifying it um, is, is still a pretty new phenomenon, let alone understanding why cells are doing it or how it would be used in disease processes or in development. And presumably for the ones that are translated, the protein is, is, non, is non, obviously going to be non-functional. Well, so it's, or it's unclear. Not so I think, so, so I don't want to necessarily say it's non-functional. I think what could be really interesting about it is, and the example I put forward is, let's say, for example, you have a two-domain protein. Mm -hmm. And within your mature circle, you mainly only encode half of that protein because you don't have the other exon. So let's say exon 2. Um, encodes a DNA binding domain, and exon 3 encodes the transactivation domain to uh, promote transcription. Mm -hmm. Well, if you make a circle that's only exon 2 and that gets translated, you would just have the DNA binding domain, and so you might imagine that some mm -hmm. sort of now like a repressor or something like that. Um, it's not, uh, there aren't yet really clear, um, really beautifully shown examples of that yet, but it's certainly things that um, we're all thinking about or how this could be working. And you said that pretty much every gene can produce these circles. Are there exceptions? That so so I, I would say at the moment, let's say it's thought that at least 15% at least of genes are, are making circles maybe in a given cell type. Um, but what's important to keep in mind there is that it can still be that we just did you know, deep sequencing and looked at hundreds of millions of reads and we got like one or two reads that supported that. Mm -hmm. So it still could be that the output of a gene, you know, 99.9% .9 of it is a linear RNA and there's a little bit of a circle. And so there's, would then still be a debate, is that functional or not? Um, but there are a lot of genes that are doing this and what we've really tried to focus are the genes where you're making a lot of the circle. Um, where it's more circle mm -hmm. than you are linear, because it's, it's just really confusing why that would be. Why, if this gene encodes a kinase that's a perfectly good protein, why would you, you know, quote unquote, waste an RNA and make a circle? The RNAs that make the circles, they're not defective in some way, and it's a way of weeding out messenger RNAs that are, have some defect. Yeah, it, it doesn't seem like it, and if anything, what would be a little confusing about a model like that is that um, once the circles are produced, they're actually very stable um, because they're covalently closed mm. uh, molecules and most decay happens from the ends of RNAs. So circles in some ways are really clever in that once they're made, they're, they're, they're resistant to the main degradation mm. enzymes. And so there's things um, like introns. When introns are spliced out, they also form lariats, which are a form of circle, and those are very rapidly debranched and degraded for the most part. And so the cell has figured out for both lariats you know, they're junk or, or useless, and so they get rid of them very rapidly. So if you thought the same thing about these circles coming from exons, you would have thought, well, the cell doesn't want these to accumulate either. So it's, un it's unclear is, I think, the simplest answer. And you said you're working on, on genes that where the circular form predominates. Is there anything particular about that class of genes? Um, not necessarily. So. What's interesting is that a lot of circles are expressed in the brain more than other places. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, a bit unclear exactly why that is. In general, alternative splicing patterns are often more complicated in brain than other places. Um, another idea that's out there, and it is, is probably tr uh, true, although it's unclear what it means, is that things like neurons are not cycling cells. 
And so you can just simply have them perhaps accumulate with time. So for example, circles accumulate with aging. But what's not mm. clear at the moment is, is this um, a bad thing? Is this like, for example, a cause of aging? Or is it actually just a, 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 a consequence that is insignificant? It's not, not clear at this point. In, in a cell like a neuron, um, do, um, w what proportion of the RNA in a, in a neuron, for example, is going to be in circles? Presumably a small fraction. A small, yeah, because the reality is most of the RNA or cell are ribosomal RNAs and things like that. So it, it's still small, but you'll have for any given gene, others have shown maybe several hundred genes where the circle will be more abundant than the linear mRNA from that gene. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just really curious why that yeah. could possibly be the case. I mean, you mentioned in your abstract about this being a, a, a sort of a, a, a post-production, um, post-transcription regulation that if there's a slowing down of pre-mRNA pre processing, the number of circles goes, goes up. up. Yeah. Uh, is that a, cl a close linkage? Yeah, so that's, um, it's unclear. So I, I think what's exciting about this whole field is it's still quite new. And so we've, for the most part, gone after it, as you said, to try to understand biogenesis. And so understanding what the sequences are that are important for them, what are the, the uh, proteins that are important for all of this. And what we often find, um, rather surprisingly, is if we knock down core spliceosome components, so that's important for splicing, required to make a circle. So I would have perhaps thought, as I think many would, that if you start inhibiting splicing, just sort of all splicing will be inhibited. Um, but instead, what we found is that actually circles go up when you inhibit kind of general splicing. And, and so what it seems is that cells now shift to more making circles than they do linear RNAs. And it's a little bit curious why that would be. I think it probably has something to do how the spliceosome is assembled and, and, and regulated. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's curious, and I think it gives ways that these circles can be regulated and potentially um, differentially functional depending on the, on the circumstance. Or is it a way of dealing with problems, pre-processing problems, you do it afterwards? Rather than yeah, I, I think that that's also has potential. So we've, we've also shown for some transcripts where you have what's called read-through transcription, so where a, a, a gene um, doesn't stop transcribing where it's supposed to but keeps going mm -hmm. further and further that that can also lead to circles. And it, in that case, whether the circle is actually um, a very important functional consequence or sort of a way to kind of say, okay, well, let's deal with this. This polymerase is just sort of going out of control. Let's um, process it in some way so that we can terminate it and kind of um, 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 get this thing restarted again. It, it's unknown. I think it's really um, um, curious. And I think that's why we like looking for these Kind of unusual looking RNAs because it tells us something about these sorts of processes that that we didn't know before. Right. So what what are the uh, unusual two questions? What are the sorts of unusual RNAs you're looking for? Do you and do you do that by serendipity or do you devise screens that enable you to to detect these things? So it, it's a little bit of both, as as you well know. With science, you try to be smart about it, but also weird things happen. Um, so one of the things we did uh, of late um, is try to do high throughput um, screening approaches where we would design uh, reporters and then try to figure out all the factors that are regulating those reporters. Mm -hmm. And often um, the hits that we get have nothing to do with what the original screen was, do, was, was for. And so an example for that, that we're a story that's a collaborative story that we're trying to finish up, is that we knocked down this complex called Integrator. And when we knocked down this, this complex, what we saw is our reporter RNA, the levels went way up. And we had knocked down individually 10,000 different things. And this complex called integrator, when we knocked it down, it caused the levels of our reporter to go up more than anything else. So in our original screen, we had nothing goal of finding integrator or anything like that. But So what is integrator? So integrator is a, is a complex of 14 subunits, and it's actually an endonuclease. Mm -hmm. So it, it will cleave um, RNAs, and it's been well um, reported in the past in the literature to cleave um, snRNAs, which are involved in splicing. And so at snRNAs, what it's supposed to do is cleave the snRNA it's being made, release it from the polymerase so that it can then uh, form a SNRP and function in splicing. And what we found is that integrator is also now regulating this mRNA that we were studying. 
And we were confused for a while why this would be, because we were very much thinking, oh, this would be an snRNA effect or something like that. But instead, what we find is that integrator can cleave nascent RNAs, just as if it was an snRNA, um, cleave that nascent RNA and terminate transcription. But whereas when you cleave an snRNA, you release the mature snRNA functions in splicing, when you cleave an mRNA, you're, you're only making a portion of that mRNA. You're not making the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so when that happens, you actually now um, terminate transcription. It's a way to turn off that gene. And so what's really interesting there is that how is that controlled? Um, it's a really nice way to keep the gene off because you're always cleaving the RNA as you're being made. But when you do actually want to make this RNA, how do you tell integrator, stop, let's make the whole transcript? So making circles is a two-step process. Integrator does this cutting. So and that then the regular splice is own. So, so, the, so the, this is unrelated. So, so this has nothing to do with, with circles. Okay. Um, so to make a circle, that's all done by the spliceosome. Um, to, to this integrator thing is completely different, although it's, it's interesting because, you know, to go back to circles for a second, how circles ultimately get degraded are unclear. They can't be degraded from ends, but presumably there's some sort of endonucleases okay. that will cleave them to degrade it. So, yeah, in short, it, it's, it's complicated. You take any given gene, and a lot of things can happen to it. You can make your normal mRNA. You can also make a circle. You can also never make it even to that stage because you prematurely terminate by having integrator come in. Um, so there's a lot happening there, and I think that's where we go after these different angles. And, and in my lab, we have very diverse interests. In some ways, it becomes hard for me to keep track of all of it because we study transcription, translation, splicing. Um, all these different stages, but we're still learning a lot, so. Well, sounds like you've got a lot of work ahead of you too. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Yes, pleasure talking. Thanks so much, Sean.